on in, fellas. Andy's getting ready to do an electrical job, and you guys are just in time to catch the show. He's got a heavy date tonight, and he's got to get this job out on time, but Bill is asking him a lot of questions and getting in his head. Oh, shucks, here comes Don, just when they were getting going good. What's the matter, Andy? Bill giving you a hard time? Oh, he's getting me all tangled up, trying to explain what's a volt, what's an ampere, what's an ohm, what's magnetism, all that stuff. What's the problem, Andy? Well, the owner says the ignition cuts in and out while he's riding along. I'm trying to get the job out tonight. Well, Bill, come on over to this bench. I'll show you some sketches on the fundamentals of electricity so you'll understand what Andy's trying to do. Let me in on this, will you, Don? I might pick up some new ideas. Sure, Tech. You can probably help me out, too. First of all, Bill, you probably know a little something about the city water system, don't you? Oh, sure. I know we get water from that water tank. But what's that got to do with electricity? Just this, Bill. The flow of electricity can be compared to the flow of water. So maybe if we talk about water first, it'll be easier to understand electricity. We know, for example, water has to be forced under pressure, usually by pumps, to make it flow through pipes. In the case of our water tank, pressure forces water to run through the outlet pipe and into the city water main. From there, it's tapped off to your house goes right up to the faucet at the kitchen sink. Hey, what is this? A lesson on the city water system? I thought you guys were talking about electricity. <laughs> we are, Bill. Take the water tank, for example. That's where we get our water supply. For the current in our car, we get our supply from the storage battery. The pressure which moves that water and makes it flow is measured in pounds per square inch. The pressure which makes electricity flow through wires is measured in volts. Volts is just another term for pressure. Well, that's okay for pressure, Don. But what about quantity? Well, let's see you give me a pail full of electricity. Well, maybe we can't fill a pail with electricity, Bill, but we can tell you how much electricity there is to work with. You know, you can measure the amount of water flowing through a pipe with a flow meter, and you can measure the amount of electricity flowing through a wire with an ammeter. An ampere, or amp, as it is commonly called, is a unit of measurement indicating the amount of flow of electricity through a wire. And the more amps that flow through a wire, the larger that wire must be. Just like a large pipe will carry more water than a small pipe. That's right. We need more current, more amperes, to crank the engine than we need to light the lights. That's why we have a large cable from the battery to the starting motor and a small wire from the switch to the light. But couldn't you increase the voltage and get more current to flow through the same size wire? Yeah, up to a certain point, Bill. But if you try to force too much water through a hose, it's apt to bust. And if you increase the voltage on a small wire to force it to carry more amps, it'll get hot and maybe burn. That happens when a small wire is used to carry a load greater than it can stand. Just like the fuse in your house, it burns out. There's another point, too, Phil, that'll affect the flow of electricity. Suppose you get a kink in your garden hose while you're watering the lawn. What happens to the pressure at the nozzle? Well, it goes to... I mean, it falls off almost nothing. Exactly. That's because there's resistance to the flow of water through the hose. Now, suppose you've got a corroded connection. That corrosion sets up a resistance to the flow of electricity, and the unit that's fed through that wire doesn't get enough current to make it operate. Of course, resistance will weaken the voltage, and therefore can be measured. An ohm is a unit of measurement indicating electrical resistance. However, when checking circuits, we check the voltage drop. Suppose you wanted to measure the pressure drop in your garden hose that has a kink in it you'd measure the pressure at the house connection and the pressure at the nozzle. The difference would be the pressure drop or loss. The easiest way to check an electrical circuit for resistance is to make a similar test with a voltmeter. Measure the voltage up to the corroded terminal and then at the terminal. The difference is the voltage drop in the circuit. 
But resistance isn't the only way you can lose current. No. Breaks in the insulation will cause loss of current if they result in a grounded or shorted wire. Just like leaks in your garden hose will cause a loss of water. Yeah, I can understand that all right. But can you tell me how a coil works? Magnetism, my boy. Didn't you ever play with a magnet when you were a kid? Well, sure. I got one in my toolbox right now. I got a coil and a magnet. It works on the magnetic principle, though, Bill. You see, a piece of iron that is magnetized sets up lines of force around it. You can't see them, but you can prove they are there. Now let's take some of these iron filings and sprinkle them on a piece of paper. Then we'll hold the magnet under the paper. You see what happens? Yeah, those filings are drawn together. They're showing you where the lines of force are, Bill. And that area affected by the pull of the magnet is called a magnetic field. There are two kinds of magnets, Bill. Permanent magnets, so-called because they hold their charge indefinitely, and electromagnets formed by passing current through wire wrapped around a piece of iron. That's the principle on which the ignition coil operates. Passing current through a coil of wire wrapped around a soft iron center forms a magnet and sets up a magnetic field. You know, of course, there are two windings in the ignition coil. The primary winding is made of a few turns of heavy wire, and the secondary winding has many turns of very fine wire. Now then, the primary winding is connected to the battery and the breaker points in the distributor. When the points are closed, current flows between the battery and the distributor through the coil primary winding. That current sets up a magnetic field in the coil. This field moves outward, just like the ripples in a pond when you throw a stone in the water. Those ripples, or lines of force, are just the same as the ones you saw acting on the iron filings, Bill. That's right, Tech. And those lines of force surround the secondary winding which is an entirely separate winding of very fine wire. One end of the secondary is connected to the center terminal and leads to the center of the distributor. The other end is grounded. When the breaker points open, the primary circuit is broken and the magnetic field set up by the primary winding collapses. This change in the magnetic field from a strong field to none sets up a voltage in the secondary winding which is much higher than in the primary, because there are many more turns of wire in the secondary winding. This stronger current goes to the distributor and spark plugs. It's a high voltage current, 10 to 15,000 volts, strong enough to make the spark jump the gap between the spark plug electrodes. Explain how the condenser works, will you, Don? Yeah. Why does there have to be a condenser in the primary circuit? The condenser helps break the circuit the instant the breaker points open, so the magnetic field will collapse faster. The faster we can make that field collapse, the more voltage we will develop in the secondary winding of the coil. Hey, somebody better turn this record over before the needle runs down the hole. As I started to say, the condenser acts like an air trap in a water system. When you close the faucet, the water backs up into the trap and compresses the air above it. This prevents a water knock, which otherwise would be produced by a sudden surge of water. Then, when the faucet is open, the normal pressure causes the water to flow out of the faucet. Now, when the breaker points open, the current has a tendency to flow across the gap. This would cause arcing and result in burning the points. However, the condenser prevents arcing by absorbing the flowing current. This causes the magnetic field to collapse when at its greatest strength, resulting in a strong spark at the spark plug. The condenser absorbs the high-pressure current in the primary winding and allows the current to flow at normal battery pressure when the points are again closed. Now you know how the coil and condenser work. So maybe it'll be easier to understand the generator. I never thought a coil and generator were alike, Tech. What do you mean? I mean that magnetic field business. There's one in every generator, too. Only you use it a little differently. That's right. You see, Bill, 
You set up a magnetic field in the generator just as you do in the ignition coil by passing current through two coils of wire called field coils. In this magnetic field, you rotate a number of coils of wire, which are part of a unit called an armature. Oh, I know what the armature is. It's the part of the generator that produces the electric current. Of course, I don't know how it does it. Think back to what we said about the ignition system, Bill. Remember that a moving magnetic field generates a current when it surrounds a coil of wire? The armature carries coils of wire through a magnetic field, Bill. That produces a current which flows through the brushes and out through the armature terminal. We could regulate the current either by controlling the speed at which the armature rotates or by changing the strength of the magnetic field. So, instead of varying the speed of the armature, we use a generator regulator to raise or lower the amount of current passing through the field coils. I'll tell you about the regulator some other time. For now, just remember that the regulator keeps the generator from overcharging the battery or generating so much current that it burns itself out. Say, it seems to me that except for the regulator, the starter's just about the same kind of machine as the generator. The starter's got field coils and armature coils, too. Boy, you're right on the beam. That's right, Bill. Both the starter and the generator have field coils to set up a magnetic field and an armature which rotates within that field. In the case of the generator, we drive the armature by the fan belt. In the case of the starter, the armature is turned by the magnetic forces developed within the starter itself. I explained to you that current flowing through a coil produces a magnet which has two ends called poles. Let me show him how these poles attract and repel each other. You see, Bill, one end is the north pole, the other the south pole. If you put two north poles or two south poles together, they'll try to push each other away, while a north pole and a south pole will attract each other. Remember, like poles repel each other, while unlike poles attract each other. That business of opposites attracting each other goes for Andy and his gal, too. They like each other because she's so small and cute, and he's so big and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing Andy didn't hear you, Ted. Now, Bill, when current from the battery flows through the starter coils, it sets up magnetic poles which push and pull each other. The north poles pulling on the south poles and pushing on the other north poles creates a force that rotates the armature and cranks the engine. Turning over a cold engine takes a lot of current, 300 amps or more. In order to carry that much current, the wires from the battery have to be large. If they were small, Bill, they'd offer so much resistance to the flow of that heavy current, they'd burn up. To control the motor, we use a switch which makes or breaks the circuit from the battery to the motor. If we locate that switch on the instrument panel, we'd have to run heavy cables to it, which would be clumsy and expensive. So, we locate the switch so we can keep the cable short and operate it from the instrument panel by remote control. The remote control switch is called a solenoid. It contains a magnetic coil just like the ones in the starter and generator. When we push the starter button, we close a switch and send a low current through the solenoid coils. This creates a magnetic field which pulls the solenoid plunger shut and closes the circuit between the battery and the motor. It doesn't take much power to operate this coil, so the wires leading to the starter button can be small. Incidentally, Bill, a horn relay works the same way. Well, Bill, that ought to give you a pretty good idea of what makes the different units operate. Think you could check out a circuit now and find the trouble? I think I could. The most common electrical troubles seem to be resistance, open circuits, and ground. I could trace those down with a voltmeter and an ammeter. Yeah, yeah. But do you know how to hook up the voltmeter and the ammeter so you'll be getting the right readings and not burn up the instruments? Well, I... I... Look, Bill, remember what we said about checking the flow of water with a flow meter? 
The water has to go through the meter in order for the meter to measure the flow, right? Yeah, sure. Well, an ammeter is an electric flow meter. The current has to go through the ammeter. So when you connect an ammeter into a circuit, you have to connect it so the current will go in at one terminal and go out at the other. Also, an ammeter has very little resistance. And if you connect it so it carries the full battery current by itself, without any other resistance in the circuit, it'll burn out instantly. So, be sure you don't short circuit that ammeter bill. Always connect it in the line so it's in series with some high resistance unit like the headlight, which will keep the current down to safe limits. But the voltmeter has high resistance, and it's perfectly safe to connect it across the circuit. That is, as long as you know the voltage isn't going to be higher than the range of the meter. You see, the voltmeter measures the difference in pressure between the current leaving the battery or generator and the current going back to it. So we connect the voltmeter across the circuit, from the hot wire to the ground. Because of its high resistance, the voltmeter draws just enough current to measure the voltage without damaging itself. Hey, it's getting late. Wonder how Andy's coming along with that job. Well, let's get back and see. Well, Andy, how are you getting along? Yeah, it's pretty late. Don't forget that day to yours. Hey, what do you think I've been sweating about? I know it's late. But it's okay, Don. She's all ready to go. The owner said the engine seemed to cut out at times, so I checked the points and plugs and the condensers. Everything seemed to be all right until... One time, when I snapped the distributor points open, I didn't get a spark. The low-tension wire was tight, so I checked it back to the switch, and it was tight there. Then I made a voltage drop check on each side of the ammeter. Still no trouble, but while I was making that test, I noticed the feed wire from the starter switch wasn't tight on the ammeter terminal. So I cleaned and tightened that connection. Everything else checks out okay now. She runs like a charm. Well, I'm glad you said clean, Andy. You know, just tightening a connection isn't always the answer to correcting voltage drop. Nice work, Andy. Yeah, nice going. You kept your delivery promise to the owner, and you'll keep your date on time, too. And that just goes to show you, Bill, how easy it is to run down electrical trouble once you understand what it's all about.